can Lebanon's armed forces modernize fast enough to make themselves the main security force within their own country? Or will a non-state armed militia group take over control? It's like my old squad leader used to always say, balancing competing geopolitical factions is too easy, huh? Lebanon's army might have the most difficult balancing act of any military power in the entire world. They have to keep the peace between the different factions within their own country while at the same time preventing war with Israel and not getting pushed around by the military group called Hezbollah. Hezbollah who? Hezbollah. It's situations like this that your average Lebanese infantryman is cast in. It's a very difficult dual role of having both to fight the enemy and keep the peace. If there's a problem, the LAF de-escalates it. They're the military world's pure mediation force. So basically your HR department could probably learn something from them. A lot is at stake here. That's why the United States military is taking close interest in the Lebanese effort to upgrade their military. For many years now, the LAF has had to struggle with having really low funding and terrible military equipment. The outcome of this tiny country has far reaching consequences that will determine if Iran or the US has a permanent base of influence in the region. In this video, we're gonna examine the Lebanese armed forces origins, their performance on the battlefield, and their effort to modernize in order to become the sole legitimate military force in the country. At the end of the video, we'll analyze the major 2017 battle against IS squared. If you enjoy these rundowns on different world militaries, fire off around to the like and subscribe button. Remember, we publish new video content every Tuesday and Thursday at 12 p.m. All right, let's move out, huh? <laughs> Lebanon is a beautiful country with a population of 6.8 million citizens. The entire country is smaller than the U.S. state of Connecticut, but they play an outsized, massive role in world geopolitics and military affairs, far more than say the state of Connecticut does. No disrespect to our nutmeg state. This is because Lebanon's geographic location is very strategically important. They're right on the key economic trade route of the Mediterranean Sea. They share a land border with Syria to the north and east, stretches 375 kilometers. To the south, they share a border with Israel, covering 75 kilometers. Not exactly like living next to your best friends, but that's okay. They're gonna make the best of this living situation. They're gonna make it work. If my infantry math is correct, that's some 400 odd kilometers that their underfunded military needs to secure. But wait a second, why is their military so underfunded? Well, following World War I, France took control of Lebanon away from Syria. I'll take that, thank you very much. Like many modern day countries, Lebanon was then given its full independence following World War II. So on August 1st, 1945, control of the Lebanese army was transferred from France to Lebanon. The LAF was formed two years later when officers and enlisted soldiers from their predecessor unit, Les Troupes Speciales, were transferred to the brand spanking new official army. French soldiers left the country and Lebanon finally had that sweet, sweet autonomy. But controlling the country was going to be a very difficult task. The government intentionally kept their army small and under-equipped because of some of the unique factors that make Lebanon different from many other countries in the region. They have an unusually large Christian population of 32% while being 67% Muslim. Therefore, the LAF is in a position where they're keeping the peace between these many different factions, all while being criminally underfunded. Sounds easy, right? So from 1950 to the end of 1960s, they never spent much on their military budget and they kept their forces at a tiny 3,500 soldiers. Now it's understandable that the higher ups in the government wanted to avoid any attempt of using the military as a means to seize power. But give me a break, you don't need to kneecap the whole army while you do that. There's some major unforeseen consequences to never investing or trusting your military leadership that you probably never think about. Case in point, 1975, different extreme militia factions within Lebanon became more powerful than the actual army, who was weak and stood no chance of maintaining stability, so a civil war broke out. During the civil war, the Lebanese army was basically just another faction out of all the other ones. LAF brigades fragmented and went into their own secretarian organizations. People placed their personal identity above their country. Instead of being the unifying force that they were meant to be, the LAF regular troops deserted left and right. This created a power vacuum in the country. In the chaos, many of these extreme groups banded together to form a militant group known as Hezbollah. Blah. This militia force is so powerful they're seen as a challenger to the actual armed forces in Lebanon. Keep in mind, 
Hezbollah receives most of their funding, equipment, and training from Iran. It would be like if tomorrow my amateur airsoft team suddenly got millions of dollars in funding from like Canada and they told us to go ahead and rival the real US military. No Carl, we can't annex Pennsylvania until Saturday. That's when my dad can lend me his 07 Ford Windstar. During the civil war in 1982, Israel troops pushed into Lebanon. There was no army to stop them. During this time, the United States also sent Marines to help keep the peace. Many believed it was Hezbollah who was responsible for the 262 American service members who were KIA while trying to help keep the peace there. On February 16, 1985, Sheikh Abraham al aman declared a manifesto announcing Hezbollah was a resistance group with the main goal of trying to end the Israeli occupation in Lebanon. This group was given credit for pushing Israel out of Lebanon by the year 2000, and it's part of the reason why they're seen in a positive light within the country. Their name translates to mean the party of God, a little presumptuous if you ask me, but okay. Worldwide, they're considered the most powerful non-state actor. Great, so they don't have to answer to any official country leadership. Isn't it comforting knowing that they don't have any of those annoying responsibilities of having to answer to any higher ups? They're absolutely committed uh, to making sure that the army has the capacity to be the sole defender of Lebanese territory and its borders and is answerable to the state and to the Lebanese people through the state. My perspective as a former lower enlisted guy is that you need to have a chain of command that stretches from the lowest regular infantryman's actions all the way up to the civilian leadership in the country that they fight for. But what about Lebanon's wars with Israel? I heard a lot of that went down. Weren't they fighting in those? Actually, no. In 2006, during the Lebanon-Israel war, the official military of the country actually didn't really participate in any of the fighting. The LAF sat on the sidelines and they, they kind of looked the other way while Hezbollah did all the combat. The LAF maintains a, a separation and plausible deniability, but they do this for a really smart and important reason, so that they can qualify to receive billions of dollars in military aid from the US of A. You might have noticed this year in your taxes, the 2F-6C support stability around the world line item. Yeah, that's where all that money's going to. So what is Hezbollah's role exactly? To give the devil its due, many people in Lebanon see Hezbollah as an institution that is willing to protect them from outside military microaggressions. They're actually better trained and qualified than the real Lebanese army. They had body armor, night vision goggles, and communications equipment, while the LAF had none of that. An Israeli soldier who participated in the war said that Hezbollah fighters were, quote, nothing like Hamas, they're trained and highly qualified. All of us were kind of surprised, end quote. So why doesn't the LAF step in and just get rid of the unofficial poser army called Hezbollah and make the LAF the only military force in the country? Well, it isn't all that simple, unfortunately. Any attempt by them to disarm Hezbollah at this point would likely turn into another civil war. These organizations have a delicate balance with each other. They mostly play coy with one another, choosing to acknowledge the other's right to exist, while at the same time pretending the other doesn't exist and publicly claiming to never cooperate. It's the military version of the silent treatment. In just a minute, we're gonna talk about their performance on the battlefield, but we need to put all this into perspective first. So you gotta remember, Hezbollah has around 50,000 total troops, while Lebanon has around 84,000. Hezbollah is also seen by many as a group, but are seen by others as a resistance group. And if you ever wanna liven up a party real quick, you know, one of those boring ones, I have the perfect tip for you. All you gotta do is bring up your personal opinions on the matter, it's why I have no friends. According to the UN Security Council Resolution 1701, Lebanon is required to keep 15,000 of their soldiers stationed in the south of the country so as to help prevent another war from breaking out there. The Lebanese army does an excellent job at this by all accounts. But this is a major resource drain on their military, so they have to rely in part on Hezbollah's forces. For me as a former American soldier, it's hard to imagine some kind of unofficial armed militia group taking responsibility and control of an entire part of my country's security. We would never allow something outrageous like that to happen right here under any circumstances. That would be absolutely absurd. That kind of thing only happens halfway around the world. So what about the Lebanese army? How are they seen by the public? And did the outcome of the recent major battles potentially change that perception? The modern LAF is incredibly successful as a unifying force in the country today. They are widely trusted by different factions because they fill their ranks with both Muslim and Christians working towards a common goal. 
they focus on integrating these units with all of the different factions working side by side. They are like the Goose Fabra, they are the Kumbaya, they are the tape on the back of your Coexist bumper sticker on your Prius. This is something that I think that the group Hezbollah could never do. But nevertheless, the limitations of the LAF's combat performance were on full display in 2007 when they faced off against an extreme insurgent group called Fatah al-Islam. It was a difficult three month long battle where they had no night vision goggles, no body armor, no rifle scopes. They almost ran out of ammo in the middle of the battle. On the other hand, the enemy was well equipped and trained. The LAF 5th Infantry Brigade lost 160 soldiers before taking out 220 enemy and ultimately winning the battle. After that fight, the US military made a move. They basically did a military version of the show Shark Tank and chose to invest $1.5 billion of funding into the LAF, hoping it would help them stand up to Hezbollah and hopefully it would prove that they could be the predominant military force and a beacon of stability in the country. What we're doing today is really receiving an entire ship full of equipment that will help the Lebanese fight the fight against extremists and defend the borders of the country. In 2011, the LAF would be tested again. This time it was by IS squared insurgent fighters who were spilling over from the civil war in Syria into Lebanon. The enemy had taken over some land and towns on their northeastern border. It was looking real bad. This was a huge make it or break it moment for the Lebanese army and they kind of dropped the ball at first. Hezbollah acted first without hesitation before the Lebanese army did. They jumped into action and started taking out the IS squared fighters. The LAF had three years to plan and execute an assault but they sat it out instead. From a high level officer leadership type perspective, this is the main challenge facing Lebanon's army, the burden of responsibility. They were paralyzed by not wanting to take any action that could drag the entire country into a bigger war with Syria, but at the same time, not acting makes them look weak. It's a classic catch-22. Finally, in August 2017, the Lebanese army launched a major offensive, codenamed Dawn of the Jurds, against 600 enemy fighters. The battle happened in the mountainous northeastern border with Syria. The LAF targeted enemy locations near the town of Ras Balik with a full spectrum of combined operations, a full battle plan. Lebanon's special forces were used in combination with armored M113 troop transport vehicles and close air support. Pilots fired over 1,000 guided Hellfire missiles. This time they had a 90% hit rate. During the course of this 10 day offensive, the LAF destroyed 35 enemy militants and took back the town. The success of this battle meant the withdrawal of the enemy forces that were spilling over from the Syrian civil war into their land. It was undeniably a victory by Lebanon's legitimate national security forces. The LAF solo campaign was so successful that elements close to Hezbollah sought to actively take credit retroactively for the LAF's success, said Iram Negrizin. There's Hezbollah acting like that guy who sticks his name on the project after all the work is done and you're ready to hand it in. Now it's important to note there are many people out there who are more pessimistic about the Lebanese army than I am. Their point of view is that the forces have either been infiltrated by Hezbollah completely or that they cooperate with them in an unofficial capacity far more than they let on. There is no coordination, not with Hezbollah or the Syrian army, said Lebanese Army General Ali Kanso. But it's undeniable that the LAF's Dawn of the Jurds campaign has had some far-reaching positive consequences for the military because it helps to permanently expand their role on the border with Syria. In order for Lebanon's army to disarm Hezbollah, they would need to far outpower them. So how does the Lebanese army equipment stack up against Hezbollah's? Since 2007, the Lebanese army upgraded from their old AK-47s to now they use the Americans' M4 rifle as their primary weapon for their frontline infantry and special forces units. But they also have about 70,000 of the M16A4 rifles, which are set to replace all of their old A1 variants by last year. They have 32 of the M2A2 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles and 80 Patton M48A5 tanks. All told, the Lebanon Armed Forces have a budget of $2.5 billion per year. Now compare that to Hezbollah and you see they're mostly working with old Soviet AK-47s and the newer AKMs. They have some Soviet BMPs for troop transports and at least 60 of the T-72 tanks. Their annual military budget is estimated to be around $700 million. 
The US has a recent plan in 2020 to send 67 million in emergency aid to prevent the collapse of the Lebanese armed forces because we all know who would gladly step in if that were to happen. It appears like today both Hezbollah and the Lebanese army have grown into stronger, more entrenched positions than they were 10 years ago. If countries like the US, UK, and France continue to give military aid to the LAF, they might mature into a force ready to take full responsibility for the country in the next 20 years. The LAF is taken seriously today after they've proven that their officers are able to use sophisticated forms of combined warfare against the enemy. Public support for Hezbollah is dwindling quickly since 2007, but they remain a huge part of the country's military puzzle. If I missed something on the topic or if you feel differently and you have a different experience with this, please comment below and let me know. I'm always open to hearing different opinions. I encourage you to do your own research if this video interested you in a topic at all. New video every Tuesday and Thursday, so remember to subscribe for that. I'm your former average infantryman, Chris Cappy. You're watching Task and Purpose, the only place that offers you defense industry analysis while in my sweatpants.